here this morning on a very chilly Lord's Day morning. It's also great to have those that are viewing online. Before our classes this morning, we're going to sing number 503, 503, all three stanzas, and then after this song, we'll ask Parker Preble to lead us in prayer before we dismiss the classes. Zion's Call. Zion's Call sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms of pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this morning so thankful for uh, the opportunity that we have to study your word and to learn from it. Father, we're thankful for all the Bible class teachers that are willing to uh, get in front of people and, and teach your word. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we are dismissed to our classes, we will be focused and attentive on what the teacher is saying. Uh, and we pray that we will be able to glean something uh, and apply it to our lives. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those who uh, may not be able to make it this morning. Father, we pray that they will uh, be able to make it at the next appointed time if it be your will. Father, please be with those who have lost loved ones and comfort them in their time of need. And Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your Son, who's the reason we're here and uh, the reason we have a hope of joining you in heaven one day. Father, we ask that you will continue to watch over us and forgive us when we fail you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We certainly want to welcome everyone to the Bible class this morning, especially if you're visiting with us. We'd like to say a very special welcome to you because you truly you are our honored guest. We'd like to welcome all those that are online with us also. We're studying in the book of Romans, chapter 16. 
And I think that we were going to think about trying to finish it up today, but uh, I'm not sure we will. If we don't finish it up today, we'll finish it up next week. And then we're going to begin our study of the book of Revelation. Last Lord's Day, we began with chapter 16, and here's what we studied. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea, that ye receive her in the Lord, as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she has need of you, for she has been a succorer of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks unto whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my beloved Epernetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Juna, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amblias, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urban, our helper in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobutus, a butless household. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Salute Tiphany and Typhosus, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which has labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute Arsentius, Fledgman, Hermas, Veropus, Hermas, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philo, August, and Julia, Nerus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Verse 16, where we're going to pick up this morning. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. The kiss there that he's talking about, of course, is declared as to what it is. It's a holy kiss. Kissing can lead to passions that are not becoming those of a Christian that will lead individuals to do things that are not appropriate. But he says a holy kiss. Now, we don't really, in the United States, don't greet people usually with a holy kiss. We greet people with a handshake. Well, until the virus started, and now we elbow, I guess that's what we'll do. In the Orient, they greet each other with a bow. And the reason they do is because they feel like that shaking hands spreads germs, and it does. So that's why they bow. And all of the Arab uh, countries and stuff, they do greet each other with a, holy, uh, with a kiss. And it says right here, you can greet each other with a holy kiss, but make sure it's a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. The churches of Christ greet you. When it says churches, it's talking about individual congregations. Because as we look to God's word, Christ only has one church, his church, the church of Christ. And you know the church of Christ is not a proper name for the name of the church. It's used to show ownership. It's also in, see, I believe it's in Acts 20 and verse 28, that we talk about the church of God. The church of God, the Son of God, which is the church of Christ. And there's a, well, some place, and I can't remember when it is, and I apologize for this, but it's talked about the, first of the, uh, the church of the firstborn. And that's of Jesus Christ, the firstborn to be resurrected from the dead, never to die again. But the churches of Christ, the name Church of Christ, is used to declare ownership. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, owns us. The church is not the building. The church are those that have been called out, and we're going to see this in just a minute, called out by the gospel, that have obeyed the gospel and added to the Lord's church. You don't join 
the church of Christ. You're added to it. And we're going to show that scripturally in just a second here. So, the churches of Christ salute you. Turn with me to Matthew, the 16th chapter. And let's begin reading with verse 13. That's Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He referred to himself as the Son of Man frequently. And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. But notice this. Jesus says, He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Now, you know, the apostle uh, Peter was really quick to speak out and to stand up for what was right. And he spoke up and he said, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Notice, God the Father that's in heaven, gave it to Peter to know that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, when speaking about Jesus Christ. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt Bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Is the rock Peter? Well, let's just look at these words and, and see what it says. And thou art Peter. Peter comes from the Greek word petros. It means a stone. You might say a small rock. And it's masculine in gender. And he says, upon this rock, that word rock there is a different word. It's Petra. Not Petros, but Petra. And it means a huge ledge, a huge rock. And it's feminine. Therefore, we can conclude without any question that the Peter and the rock are too different. That thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. It's not upon Peter. It's on something else. And we can find out that something else in verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Lord's church is built upon the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he says, I will build my church. Notice what Jesus says. Now this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, saying this. My church. Singular. My, the Lord, is the Lord's church. And that's why it can be called the Church of Christ, because it is Christ's church. And if you're a faithful member of the Church of Christ then you are a faithful member of the body of Christ and it is describing ownership. You know, all my life, of course, my last name's Hughes and my dad was Joe Hughes and my mom was Dorothy Hughes. And when I introduced myself, I'd say, well, I'm Joe Hughes. And someone might say, oh, you're the son of Joe and Dorothy Hughes. And I'd say, that's right. That sh my name shows ownership, who owned me. And that's the same thing with the church of Christ. The church of Christ, the church, the singular church that Christ shed his precious blood for is the church of Christ. It shows ownership. I'm a member of the church of Christ. I am owned by the Lord. And that's what it's saying. But notice in verse 19, and I will give unto thee 
the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I will give unto thee, and he's talking to Peter and the other apostles, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom. He's referring to the church. The church and the kingdom are one and the same. But notice, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. What are keys? What are keys for? Well, keys are to open up something, aren't they? For instance, if you have a key to go to your house and you go home services, you have to sometimes unlock the door if you lock your doors, which I think we all do this day and time. You have to unlock the door to be able to get in. And this is what the keys of the kingdom are. It's the terms of entrance. What we must do as an individual to be a member of the Lord's church. If we turn to Acts, the second chapter, on the day of Pentecost, in verse 14, And Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. This is the first gospel sermon that was ever preached. And Peter preached it. And he preached the sermon, and you can study it. But I call your attention to verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom thou crucified, both Lord and Christ. You know, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached to the Jews. And it's not until we go to Acts the 10th chapter we find that Peter went to Cornelius and his household, which are the first Gentile converts to the Lord's church, that we hear that the Gentiles are able to be added to the church. Now, I don't know how long it is. I've heard about 10 years, but I don't know for a fact. It doesn't say that in the scriptures that I know of, so I'm not going to say it's 10 years. But whatever time existed between the, the, the establishment of the Lord's church on the day of Pentecost in about 33 A.D. to whenever it was that Cornelius and his household had the gospel proclaimed to him, that's how long it was between the Jews and the Gentiles to obey the gospel. We have to remember that Abraham, the father of the Jews, was given the promise that someday there would be one that would come that would bless all nations. And when it says all nations, it means Jews and Gentiles. And that one was Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Here we find the Lord's church being established on the day of Pentecost. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were touched in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? You know, that's just like you find out that you're a sinner and you're lost. And you ask the question, what shall I do? Well, verse 38, the keys to the kingdom, keys to the church were added that day. And here's what Peter says. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter said to them, You need to repent. What is repentance? Well, you know, a lot of people think that being sorry for what you've done is repentance, but that's not. That's sorrow, and that leads to repentance. But what is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of life, a life lived for the Lord. Now, notice that. Repentance is a change of mind it's going to lead to something. It's going to lead to a change of life. 
And that change of life, you're going to be lived. You're going to live your life for Jesus Christ. And he says, and be baptized, every one of you. Why are we baptized? God's Word tells us right here and right now why we must be baptized to be saved. You know, Mark 16 and 16, Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And here's why. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins. It's in the act of baptism that you come in contact with the precious blood of Jesus Christ and your sins are washed away. Now, when that happens and you are saved, according to Mark 16, 16, Look in verse 47 of Acts, the second chapter. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. You don't join the church of Christ. You're added to the Lord's church by the Lord himself. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So you're added to the Lord's church to live your life faithful for the Lord. But how do we know what to do? How, how do we, we, let's picture one. It's an individual that's born, and I did this, and you did that. We were born into this world completely innocent, without sin. But sometime in our life, we sinned against God, and we're lost. So we ask ourselves, what, what can I do? Look at 2 Thessalonians The second chapter, verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are called by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, according to Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're called by the gospel. And through obedience to the gospel, we receive salvation. Paul tells us in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So here we have this individual struggling along out here in this world that's lost. And we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're baptized into Christ where we are baptized into his death, which is where we come in contact with that precious blood. And it washes away our sins. We're forgiven. We're saved. And then we're added to the Lord's church. But you know, my friend, that's just the beginning. That's not the end. Because Jesus teaches us in Revelations 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. We must live our life faithfully for Jesus Christ until we either die or the Lord comes back again. And then we will receive a crown of righteousness, which is saying that we'll go to heaven. So when we look at the ch churches of Christ, we are talking about those that have been called out of the world and added to the Lord's church because they have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and been saved. Now, you know, one lives in the world, but one can live of the world. And we're all in the world at one time. But when we're called out of the world, we can be in the world but not of the world any longer because we live our lives for the master. Verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. What's, what is the doctrine that he's talking about here? 
Well, it's the doctor, uh, doctrine of Jesus Christ. Look in 2 John, the ninth, ninth chapter. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. The doctrine of Christ is just another way of talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So it's the doc doctrine of Jesus Christ that we must be obedient to. Notice in verse 10, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. It's the gospel of Christ. It's the doctrine of Christ. And we must abide the doctrine of Christ to be saved and to go to heaven. He says, Now I beseech you, brother, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. What is it that we, we do as Christians? We obey the gospel of Jesus Christ as taught through the Bible, through the Word. And we must do what the Bible tells us to do. Now, if we go to 2 Timothy, the third chapter, we're going to find out exactly where we look to to find what we must do to obey the gospel and what we must do to go to heaven. And when we look to 2 Timothy, the second, I'm sorry, the third chapter, verses 16 and 17. Written by inspiration, here's what the Apostle Paul wrote. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, Thoroughly furnished into all good works. You know, as you look at this, it says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God's Word is the only inspired Word that we have that God tells us what we must do to be saved, to live our life for the Lord, and to go to heaven. I know there's a lot of books out here today that you can read. They have all these books that says if you want to live a happy life, here's what you do, or that and this. And they teach you different things. But if you really want to truly know what you must do to go to heaven, there's only one source, and that's God's Word. When you look at God's Word, there's a saying if you can't read it, you can't believe it. Well, I add to that, if you can't read it, you can't believe it. But I add to it, if you can read it, you better believe it. Because when you look at 2 Thessalonians and look at verse 7, as we begin reading, Chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That's when Jesus comes back. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. For those that know not the gospel and have not obeyed it. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Separated from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit throughout all eternity. That is talking about hell.
When we look to God's Word, I call your attention to Revelation, the 22nd chapter. And in verse 18 and 19. Yeah, I like to see y'all turning in your Bibles to what I'm going to say. You know, I think today, one of the things that hurts mankind more than anything else is to listen to another man and believe what they say without any other evidence and do it what they say. You know, when we teach the Bible, we don't want us, this is not what we say or what we believe. Hopefully we believe what the Word says, but we teach the Word. It's what God says. And this morning, as I'm teaching the Scriptures, I don't want you to believe what I'm saying. I want you to believe what God's Word's telling us. Because hopefully and prayerfully, that's what I'm teaching is what God's Word says. So you open up your Bibles and see what I'm saying is from God's Word. If it's God's Word, we can believe it. If it's not, then we don't need to believe it. But notice in this, in Revelation, the 22nd chapter, verses 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And notice in verse 19, And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. What we're being told there is we're not to add to nor to take away from God's word. If God says it, that settles it. And if you can't read it, you can't believe it. If you can read it, you better believe it. So God's word is our answer to whatever the question is that we're asked. But let's be sure that we look to God's word and see that which is right. You know, you can quote whatever God's word said. And I think it's wonderful. I, I know men that preach the gospel that they, they have the whole New Testament memorized. I mean, they just can quote scripture after scripture. And I think that's wonderful. Now, unfortunately, I'm not that way. I just kind of limited what I can memorize and remember. But the way I look at it and the way I like it is when someone's going to teach from God's word, they say, okay, open up the Bible. Let's just say we're going to teach John 3.16. Now, we all know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We can quote it. But I say, let's open up to just turn to John 3, 16, and let's read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now we know that that came from God's word. And those are words that Jesus Christ said himself. So when we go to not adding to nor taking from, we go back to the very thing that is taught. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, in verse 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Every single word in God's word is inspired from God. It came from God. God is the author. Man penned it, but it came from God. And it's proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, and that word man there I feel like is really the generic term. It would be for the woman also, may be perfect, are completely, thoroughly furnished into all good works. God has given us everything that we need to know and everything that we need to do to go to heaven. But it will all be based upon God's grace, his unmerited favor, given to us what he wants us to have and not what we deserve. Verse 18, For they... 
that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. Those that teach a doctrine other than the doctrine of Christ do this for their own belly and by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. How do we know when someone stands before us and teaches or someone stands before us and preaches that they're preaching and they're teaching the truth? You open up God's word and see. Just like this morning. You have God's word in your hands, open it up. And if I say something that's not according to God's word, I expect someone to stand up and correct me. Because the fear I have is to teach error. But let's just teach God's word and that's all. Nothing more, but nothing less. And see what God tells us that we must do to inherit eternal life with him. So, we will study God's word and that's what we will study. You know in this life, we're going to serve one or two. We're either going to serve Jesus Christ and go to heaven or we're going to serve Satan and go to hell. And what is so wonderful about it, God has allowed us to make that decision as to where we're going to go, where we're going to spend eternity. Notice this in verse 19. For your obedience is come abroad unto uh, to all men. I am glad, therefore, of, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. He says, for your obedience is come abroad unto all men. He's talking about the brethren at Rome. That's what he's talking about right there. And he says, for they, uh, it says, for your obedience is come abroad unto all men. Look to Romans, the sixth chapter. We're going to look at verses 17 and 18. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. That doctrine is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul, Paul spent his life preaching. Just turn back to Galatians, the first chapter, and look at verse 11. Here's what Paul wrote. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For neither I received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. What Paul preached, what he wrote, was by the revelation of Jesus Christ. It was inspired, the inspired word of God. The only thing we have that God will tell us what we must do to go to heaven. Verse 18, then being made free from sin, because they had obeyed the gospel, they had been baptized into Christ, the blood of Christ washed away their sins, ye became the servants of righteousness. The servants of God is what we became. It's all based upon the Word of God. The Word of God is the most important thing that we have on the face of this earth. To show you how important it is, look to Matthew, the fourth chapter. In Matthew, the fourth chapter, we're going to see how Christ is tempted. Are any of us ever tempted every day? I think we're all tempted so many. And this day and time, temptation is dime a dozen, you might say. It's coming our way all the time. And the question is, is what do we do when we're tempted? Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, the devil is going to tempt Jesus Christ, the Son of God, just like he tempts us every single day. And Jesus is going to give us the answer to what we must do to avoid this temptation. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. 
And when the tempter came to him, that's Satan, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said unto him, Now notice, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city, and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written, Again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceedingly high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory, of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. It is written, God's word. God's word is everything to us, the Christian. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Paul was getting ready to come to him. And when he came to him, he was going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was just going to put Satan down further than what he's already been put down. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. What is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. I heard a definition of grace years ago that I've never forgotten. That means so much to me. God's grace is God giving to me what he wants me to have and not what I deserve. There's not one of us that deserve to go to heaven. But by God's grace, we can. By doing what God's word tells us to do. Obey the gospel and live your life faithfully for the Lord. And then he tells us that we'll go, away, go to heaven. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So be it. So be what he's just said. Verse 21. Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and so Sipater, my kinsman, salute you. I apologize if I pronounce some of these names or all of them wrong, but I'm doing the best I can because sometimes these, these names are pretty hard to, uh, to pronounce as far as I'm concerned. But T Timotheus, that's Timothy. We know him. He was Paul's son in the faith, in the faith, in the gospel. My fellow work fellow, work fellow. And Lucius, that's Luke. You know, I can't wait to get to heaven and meet Luke. Luke, the beloved physician. And I look forward to it. People don't really realize what Luke did. I, I'm sure he was a, a good doctor. But did you know that Luke wrote more of the New Testament than any one writer? Someone says, no, Paul did. No, Paul wrote more books of the New Testament. But Luke wrote the gospel according to Luke, and he wrote Acts of the Apostles. And if you take that volume right there, that is the, more, the most one writer wrote of the volume. And so Luke, the beloved physician, wrote more of the New Testament than any one writer. Yes, Ben? He was also a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. Yeah, he was also a Gentile. But I tell you what, brother, I really look forward to, to meeting Luke someday. But um, he wrote more of the New Testament than anyone writing. Just like Brother Ben said, he was a Gentile and not a Jew. 
Well, we didn't get through, but we're not going to rush the scriptures just to get something else. So here's what let's do. Why don't we just pick up at verse 21 next Lord's Day, and I'm sure we'll finish up uh, Romans next Lord's Day, and after we finish that, then we'll begin our study of the book of Revelation.